very much, Ira. And I'd like to invite uh, Professor Dan Rabinovich. Dan Rabinovich is a professor at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology here at Tel Aviv University. He was the head of the Israeli Anthropology Society and the head of the Porter School for Environmental Studies. His main area of research is the social, economic, and political implications of climate change. Danny, please. Thank you, On. Let me just... All right, so um, let me first um, express appreciation to um, On Barak, to Avner Vishnitzer, and their enablers, both the uh, leaders of the Faculty of the Humanities and the School of um, History here at Tel Aviv, as well as Asaf, and the others who helped with the academic and logistics um, that went into organizing this, this conference. From sporadic conversations amongst us here, I think that many of us um, are impressed um, with the thoughtfulness and the rigor that went into designing this event. Having the humanity, humanities join the climate debate is great intellectual and research news, so keep up the good work. Uh, also, speculative histories are fun. Um, I um, attended high school in a very conservative um, establishment in Haifa, and some of us really loved history. Um, there was also a charismatic teacher involved, and one of the exercises that, that we often tried to do was to do our version of speculative history. What would have happened if the barbarians changed directions and never approached Rome? And we were not allowed to do that. You don't do this in, that, this in history, they told us. This is back in the 19, late 60s. So I'm glad 50 years later you guys allow, allow me to do it. Um, the evolving nexus between modernity, energy, and climate can be simplified into, simplified into five sequential phases that you see in front of you. Industrial mechanization, the first energy revolution which had the ascent of fossil fuels, the exponential material growth um, enabled by the revolution, th these two revolutions um, and that came into fruition in, in late modernity, the advent of climate change, and a second energy transformation from fossil fuels to renewable uh, energy, which, if completed rapidly enough, might hopefully arrest climate chaos. Uh, the five could be argued to reflect a causal progression, or at least a chronological one, but that is not my main concern today. Uh, my presentation focuses on the two, counter on two counterpunctual moments belonging to the two phases that appear in color in this slide. So one is the emergence since the interbellum and more substantially since the 1960s of Middle Eastern oil as a key component of the, of the political economy of late modernity. The other is the counterintuitive possibility that the imminent demise of fossil fuel could turn Middle Eastern oil producers into the white knights of the struggle to arrest climate change. So these are my two counter, um, uh, uh, my two speculative historical moments. One belongs to the past, the other more to the, to the, to the present. I present this paper with a sense of urgency. It combines a, a diagnostic perspective, the point on the role of Middle Eastern uh, oil in our contemporary climate crisis is steeped in a critique of capitalism, colonialism, consumerism. Um, it also has a prognostic drive and a remedial urge. The three are not necessarily related. 
The life expectancy of CO2 in the atmosphere, 100 years, depending on altitude, suggests that correctly identifying, identifying the causes of the, of the current crisis and indexing the good road not taken is not deterministic of a blueprint for deliverance. So the two do not necessarily correspond. Colonialism, capitalism, consumerism might take longer to undo than uh, drastically cutting CO2 emission within the confines of a world lamentably stuck in its old and rotten ways. So these are two projects and they do not necessarily have to coincide. In a morally perfect and theoretically coherent world, we could perhaps correct the wrongs of bygone days by directly redressing the injustices which produced it. The rigid time frame which the biosphere now imposes calls for an instrumental, urgent, perhaps uh, urgent solution, uh, perhaps along the lines of what Ulrich Beck called emancipatory catastrophism. I guess this is my disclaimer for approaching the challenge presented in this workshop with a hands-on pragmatic rather than overly theoretical prism. prism. So let me uh, move right into it. First, the ascent of Middle Eastern oil. Oil, first produced commercially in Pennsylvania in the late 1850s, became a linchpin of the world's economy a century later, with the Middle East playing a major role. Orchestrated by US oil companies, whose interests converged with those of the US State Department, the discovery and early production of oil in the Middle East was seminal in the making of Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Bahrain, and Oman into modern states. Local chiefs in these six countries were enticed to sign off oil production franchises for a percentage of the profits as royalties. Leaning on this revenue to prop up their own economies, the local potentates became increasingly dependent on a security umbrella provided by the US, complete with weapons, US bases, and occasionally military in inter intervention. Lax labor and environmental regulations enabled the oil companies to minimize costs and maximize profits. An ever-expanding global consumer culture ensured insatiable demand for oil. In 1974, the six kingdoms by the Gulf formed the Gulf Corporation Council, GCC, which quickly became the backbone of the organization of petrol, petroleum exporting countries, OPEC. The new web of oil dependency which emerged since the 1970s meant that the GCC six do not merely lean on oil as their primary source of income, they are defined by it. On the upside, they have experienced one of the most spectacular material booms the world has ever seen. The United Arab Emirates GDP in, 19, in 2018 was 138 times its 1973 value. So it, the economy grew by a factor of 138. Saudi Arabia's GDP leaped 50-fold from 1973 to 2014. The US, in comparison, saw GDP growing 14 times in the same period. Germany's grew only tenfold. On the downside, riding the tiger of global aid, oil addiction, the GCC6 are deeply implicated with the realities of the fossil fuel economy, CO2 emissions, and consequently, global warming. My speculative twist to this history is the following. Middle Eastern oil and gas make the world's most easily and cheaply extracted supplies. They come at a ridiculously low franchise cost, on average 5% for royalties, mutatis mutandi between the countries and between periods. It's ch slightly changing recently. What if they had not appeared at all on the global stage in the first place in the 1930s when a New Zealander a geologist made first discoveries of commercial oil in Saudi Arabia, or failed to become so dominant since the 1950s? What if local sheikhs resisted the offers they received from US multinationals 
for the sake of protecting their culture and sovereignty or in an effort to extract shares for the people more compatible with the share which landowners in Pennsylvania, Oklahoma, Mississippi, and Texas got? What if the Soviet empire had beaten the US oil industry in the race to Middle Eastern oil, bringing the Gulf and its resources under the canopy of the sluggish, inefficient internal trade exchanges of the communist bloc. In all these cases, in all these hypothetical cases, the impact would, of course, have been Im immense for the GCC6 themselves. More importantly for me today, however, it would have changed the inextricable links between late capitalism and energy in dramatic fashion. Bereft of an endless supply of cheap, hence immeasurably lucrative oil, the chains of demand for f fossil fuel would have been weaker, creating more daylight for both the need and willingness to switch to alternative forms of energy over the years. S such turn of events would have considerably weakened the insatiable quest of oil magnets and governments all over for a deepening and exceedingly better disguised regime of subsidies which underwrites the carbon economy even today. So this is the first moment that I want to reflect on. The second moment I'm interested is happening now and has to do with the current energy revolution, um, the second uh, colored uh, line on this slide, um, the current energy revolution whereby fossil fuels are set to be eclipsed by renewable sources quite soon. The crucial question is, of course, the timing, extent, and pace of this transformation, which some, some already say have already be, has already begun. A decade earlier or later could mean the world for, inter, for the international effort to curb global warming. In such circumstances, could the threat of the imminent demise of fossil fuel push Middle Eastern oil producers to reinvent themselves as the white knights of the struggle to arrest climate change? So this is the question that I pose here. At first glance, a path which leads the GCC6 towards alternative sources of energy, thus sacrificing the golden calf that brought them untold riches, seems impossible. With oil and gas gushing away in solid pipelines and petrodollars flying in the opposite direction, why would those who benefit elect to break away? Well, here are some reasons for them to consider such an option and for us to consider it. Controlling among them a quarter of current oil production and half of global known reserves, the kingdoms by the Gulf, like, I've, like other oil exporting countries, now realize they live on borrowed time. As the cost of electricity generated from solar panels and wind turbines goes down, uh, you don't need to uh, go into, th into the numbers too much, but this is the cost of solar photovoltaic electricity over time, and these are the costs of conventional um, um, means of, of producing uh, of produce, uh, electricity. So as the cost of electricity generated from solar panels and wind turbines goes down, the day the cost will steep as low as that of power generated by burning fossil fuels or lower is getting nearer. Meanwhile, electric cars are poised to dominate streets and highways globally, and innovative technologies of concentrated solar power, CSP, could soon be driving even heat-intensive metallurgic processes. This progress is already changing the realms of electricity production, transportation, and industry worldwide in an irrevocable manner. When all of them will have matured, demand for oil and gas could plunge dramatically, leaving countries whose incomes are wholly dependent on this trade in the doldrums. The world has already seen such a dynamic in the case of salt in late 19th century Europe. 
For centuries, the preservation of fresh meat and other foodstuffs consumed immense quantities of salt. Rigid demand made salt a commodity of extraordinary value that played strategic role in the economic, political, and social lives of many regions. Then electric refrigeration appeared, first in commercial establishments, then as a domestic appliance, and sent demand for salt tumbling down. Peripheral industries like the mining, refinement, storage, and marketing of salt were quickly dragged in an irreversible downward spiral. The threat that oil might run its economic course long before reserves are finally exhausted looms large on many oil-producing countries. Nowhere, however, is this vision more menacing than in the kingdoms by the Gulf, where oil accounts for upwards of 90% of GDP. When oil and gas have been replaced by renewables in power stations, transportation, and even heavy industry worldwide, the economic viability of the GCC6 will be irreparably dislodged. Not surprisingly, the need to diversify their economies has become a buzzword in the Gulf in recent years. Declarations to that effect, economic planning blueprints, and some investments in, in industries other than oil have become the order of the day. But the predicament still looms. Second, the Gulf has some of the most alarming climate predictions globally. Scaled down climate models for the region, published in recent years, use a combination of heat and humidity known as wet bulb temperature, WBT. 35 degrees WBT is considered a threshold above which even able-bodied humans cannot safely spend meaningful time outdoors. Significantly, they point, they point, these models point at the shores of the Arabian Gulf as likely to become too hot for humans to inhabit by 2060. Doha in Qatar, Kuwait City in Kuwait, Dharan in Saudi Arabia, Bandar and uh, Manshar in Iran are cases in point. Even more dramatically, Dubai and Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates, two of the most extravagant and affluent metropolitan centers in the world today, <clears throat> could hit the 35 WBT threshold, threshold even if climate change proves relatively mild. As heat stress mounts, labor conditions, business routines, and behavioral norms in those territories will need to be adjusted, potentially radicalizing occupational stratification further. Households with young, old, or the infirm will seek to relocate if they can afford to. Those with lesser means will stay behind, enduring even worsening conditions. And while the future of oil and the future of climate bode unfavorably for the GCC6, the potential for renewable energy stands out. Four features make the GCC6 particularly suitable for rapid expansion of alternative energy. With more than 300 sunny days a year, irradiation is unparalleled, making the potential for photovoltaic solar generation virtually unlimited. With little available water, large expanses of cheap land can be used for expensive solar fields, for expansive solar fields, as the United Arab Emirates is already doing. Third, the GCC6 have virtually unlimited capital reserves that could be invested in this growing economy. Fourth, while none of the six have been known for technological innovation, all of them have exemplified remarkable abilities to import and integrate cutting edge technology into their civil infrastructures. Recent tenders for renewable power in the, in the United Arab Emirates, uh, for example, have solar electricity sold to the grid for as little as 1.9 cents per kilowatt hour, a level virtually identical to power generated in oil and gas-fired station, stations. So here you see uh, um, levels not as low as the one that I just mentioned. This came after this study. But uh, this is the name of a power station uh, in the in, in a, uh, UAE. And this is the cost, 2.4 cents per kilowatt, which is very low and almost on a par with what uh, the United Arab Emirates are paying 
the utilities for um, electricity from fossil fuels, mainly from gas and, and, and oil. Um, and I think there's another indication of this. Um, again, uh, uh, this is the two cent per kilowatt mark, this is the four cent, and these are very recent tenders that have, uh, again, some power stations in, um, uh, in the uh, UAE going down almost to the two, two cent per kilowatt uh, level, and as I say, the, the, this, bro uh, this record has been broken since. Um, an additional va vector that might push the GCC6 in this direction is the unique positioning at the epicenter of the global energy market, accounting, as I said, for a quarter of current global oil and half of all available reserves. The GCC6 have the leverage to influence and sometimes determine the quantity of oil produced globally, its, di its distribution, and most importantly, its price. They could time a shift from fossil fuels to renewables to fit their best interests. Finally, the internal governance structures of the GCC6, with little in the way of checks and balances, affords their rulers and the legislative councils they appoint considerable leeway. Agreement reached by this exclusive circle of perhaps 200 men between them in the six countries could instantly redraw the boundaries and content of the global energy market. Here then is the counterintuitive operational pathway uh, that could be opening here. here. What if leaders of the kingdoms by the sea soon conclude that their best bet for the post-oil era is to dramatically convert their own domestic electricity production to renewables, a process they have already embarked on, um, and a process that other countries are doing very successfully. This is uh, the, the, the amounts for Denmark, and the, and the yellow uh, marks here are the percentage of the electricity market that is now using renewables. You, I'm not sure you can see the numbers, but we're looking at about 20, 25% in Denmark, and we're looking at um, a, 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 around 20%, the top 20% here are all renewable uh, energy. Um, so, so what if leaders of the kingdoms by the sea soon conclude that this is good for them and the best bet for the post-oil era is to dramatically convert their own domestic electricity production to renewables, a process they have already embarked on and other countries are doing quite successfully. These are the percentages of the overall, overall uh, electricity production that is using renewables. Uh, very low for most of them, but again, the United Arab Emirates were at 2% in 2018, but they're already in at 3.5% in 2019, so it's growing very quickly. And what if in parallel to doing this, they intensify their global investment in renewables? And then once they have secured a good share of the emerging global market of renewables, they dramatically reduce their oil and natural gas production perhaps when they get to 25% of the global market, which they could, given their financial means. Properly timed, this, the dent in global supply they will have caused by, by um, uh, dramatically reducing their own production will have caused and uh, would, have, would have pushed up the price of oil, perhaps enough to establish renewables as the cheapest most convenient source of energy worldwide almost overnight. Making good on their investment, they will have completed an elegant transfiguration of their pole position in the oil market, ante, to a similarly dominant pasture in the energy universe of the future. Am I being over-optimistic here? Perhaps. One must never underestimate the tendency of vested interests to glorify and consecrate the status quo, which benefits them and, and resists change. Elites, as well as humbler citizens in oil-producing countries, have grown accustomed to an inertial, effortless routine of affluence, which they may well be loath to risk. Also, with considerable, with considerable proportions of their financial assets held elsewhere, 
those who call the shots in oil fiefdoms can quickly relocate personally and their families to cooler, more affluent locations if climate conditions at home finally deteriorate. So, so I'm not necessarily saying this is a deterministic uh, pathway that will need to be followed. And there are strong arguments to say that there are obstacles to it. But isn't this what speculative history's conferences are for? Here are two additional factors that could play a role here. One is that the international community, desperate for progress in the struggle against climate change, might be persuaded could to compensate oil producers for cutting down production. The notion that wealthier nations should help poorer ones to pay for adaptation efforts and mitigation has been a standard feature of global climate pact <coughs> proposals since Kyoto 1997. And while remunerating oil producers for relinquishing reserves is not normally included, included in such blueprints, the Saudis have raised such a demand before. It is incident, uh, incidentally a page right off the OPEC playbook, which has occasionally found ways and means to compensate its member states for lowering production in an attempt to meet restrictions imposed by the cartel itself. So here we will have restrictions imposed maybe by the international uh, community, or at least encouraged, um, for which the international community might be willing to pay maybe not all, the whole cost, but some cost. Second, GCC leaders might opt to proactively eclipse oil also for reasons of the prestige and honor associated with doing the right thing. Would those who see themselves as, as representatives of moderate Islam not wish to have the ultimate solution to a looming global catastrophe come from their own backyards? Could not their proud association with a culture that gave human civilization algebra, astronomy, and cartography persuade them to embark on a trajectory that could secure them a venerated place in history. Finally, um, this counterintuitive notion that um, solution to global warming, or at least the, uh, reducing the amount of time we need to wait until the, the, the market does its work in a, in a, in a natural uh, way, um, presents another, um, another challenge, maybe, to many of us. Uh, many of us have become accustomed to the notion that the road to climate salvation um, follows a liberal democracy and science pathway. So scientists will produce the credible information that will um, convince more and more people ab about the perils. Um, Awareness will be uh, rising amongst low, lo, much, um, uh, larger parts of the population, translated into political uh, energy. Uh, governments will need to follow through and eventually be forced to do what they've been avoiding for the last 20 or 30 years, which is to force the, uh, the carbon uh, multinationals to reduce their production and to force consumers to go in alternative, uh, in alternative ways. I think um, the notion that climate redemption would not come via this liberal democratic pathway, but rather be led by a bunch of arch conservative, um, corrupt um, despots running completely undemocratic countries is, an, is another challenge for all of our consciousness. Thank you.